what we will be learning over the course of next 45 minutes to 50 minutes is that, you know, I'm just going to briefly touch upon the, on the basic principles of orthogram. You know, what are the various techniques which are available when we talk about a shoulder orthogram. And I will also talk about, you know, uh, what, what is shoulder instability and, and various spectrums of pathologies that one would come across in shoulder instability. So let's start off with the uh, basic principle. First and foremost, it's got to be a steroid technique. The last thing that you want is you inject somebody's joint and then them coming up with uh, an infection. We don't want that to happen. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like a crime. So obviously, we've got to ensure that everything is clean and sterile. And uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, of course, you need a lot of stuff. You need contra contrast, both the MR contrast and as well as CT contrast. You need some normal saline. I also mix it with bifibacaine. And you need various syringes. And uh, the key thing is the dilution is 1 in 200. If you take 20 ml of uh, any, any fluid, you need to mix it up with 0.1 ml of uh, MR contrast. You're talking about 1 in 200 dilution. If you take uh, 40 ml, so you just sort of, you've got to make sure that it's 1 in 200 dilution. dilution. Otherwise, you know, your images may look uh, uh, probably not so optimal. Indications. Um, probably if you had asked me about uh, six, seven years back, about what are my indications for MR orthogram, I would say anybody who, wherein there is a suspected labor pathology, I was just jumping and I was doing the MR orthogram. Uh, right now, with the advent of uh, three Tesla, uh, which has come into picture, uh, to, to, to give you a perspective, I was actually doing almost about uh, eight to 10 MR orthograms uh, a week, probably about seven years back. Right now, you know, I hardly do. Uh, partly because, you know, one, in India, you don't get references. And two, uh, most of the times you get a you get an answer on a on a three Tesla MRI. But for all practical purposes, uh, for today's talk, I'm going to spend a bit more time trying to tell you how I go about doing an orthogram, and what all the you know the subtle things that you need to look out for. So as I said, indications is suspected labral pathology and also post-operative shoulder. Post-operative shoulder is always a, a tricky thing and uh, uh, especially in the post-operative labral reconstruction which they have done and if you want to say that uh, it is torn or not, so you need to probably give contrast. Uh, in terms of patient position, uh, let's see if the audio works. Okay. So the audio doesn't work. So what I'm trying to say here is, I'm just trying to say how the patient positions. So you've got to, no, no, it, it didn't work. So what I'm trying to say is, if you see in this image, if you look at this guy, you know, the hand, the palm is facing upwards. So sometimes you may have to put a sandbag just to ensure that the palm, you know, faces top. It's got to be in a perfect kind of a neutral position. You don't want too much of internal rotation, too much of external rotations. So this position is very, very critical. So make sure that, you know, it is dead straight with the palm facing upwards. And if you want, you can actually keep a sandbag just to facilitate that. So that, any any questions on patient position? Or you, I, I guess everybody is happy with the patient position. The next one, I mean, unfortunately, if the audio works, I can tell you what I was actually So the next step, what I do is, once I have actually positioned him properly, I'm going to do the marking. You know, I need to mark where I need to go, right? So what I do is, I basically just screen to ensure that I get this kind of an image, right? And once I have done that, my needle entry point, there are various ways of doing the shoulder orthograms. The one which I am showing you is an anterior approach and that's how I do my norm, you know, normally, how I do norm, my, my orthograms. You know your corocoid process. You all appreciate that this is your corocoid process, right? And this is the bottom aspect of the corocoid process. Okay, you're all happy that this is a corocoid process. This is the bottom level. So I just go exactly, if I draw a straight line, I go for that most medial aspect of the humeral head not into the joint, my aim is to hit that bone. Okay? You're all happy. So basically, if I draw a corocoid process over here, you know, roughly, you know, you can either say 
basically Korokat process because it angles it, so you just need to know where it dips down. Just go exactly there and then go for this spot. This is the spot that you need to look out for, right? And now let's start off what all things I need. So the things that I will be requiring is, I will require my insulin syringe, that is for me to take a 0.1 ml of uh, uh, MR contrast. And then the next one I would require is a 10 ml syringe wherein I normally take my lignocaine. I'm just telling you how I do it. I mean different people have got different ways of doing it. Okay, so this is, and then I will take a 5 ml syringe and I will use a CT contrast. You got my point. So I take my contrast, you know, MR contrast in insulin syringe and then lignocaine in 10 ml syringe and in my 5 ml syringe I will take the CT contrast and that's the big whammy. You know, that's a 20 ml syringe. What I will do is, in the 20 ml syringe, I will be taking, you know, I will be mixing up all my stuff. Okay? Let's move on to the, the second one. So, this is how I will take my stuff. You know, this is the insulin syringe. I have already taken 0.1 ml of uh, my Magnavis or any kind of an MR uh, uh, contrast medium. So, I have taken 0.1 ml of that. Now, I have taken 5 ml of CT contrast. And then in the 20 ml syringe, what I have done is, I have taken approximately about 15 ml of normal saline, 15 ml of normal saline. And now I'm actually mixing it with Bipivake. There are various ways. I mean, this is how I normally do. The reason why I actually mix up with Bipivake is most of these patients, there are two reasons. One is most of these patients uh, have pain, right? And then, you know, of course, if I put in a Bipivake, it is always, you know, they will be pain free. That's not one way of looking at it. The second way of looking at it is, you know, sometimes you get sort of non-specific sort of shoulder pain. If I mix up with a Bipivacaine and if I do an intra-articular administration and if the patient says that the pain disappears, I exactly know that the pain is actually probably intra-articular in origin. There's some pathology which is within the joint which is actually contributing to the pain. So th that's why I tend to take 15 mils of normal saline and mix with uh, 5 ml of BPVK. So once I have done that, to that I will actually mix that 0.1 ml of uh, my MR contrast. So basically you, you got all the dilutions, right? I mean you got 15 ml of normal saline, you got 5 ml of uh, BPVK for, you know, within which I have mixed 0.1 ml of uh, my Magnavist. This is what I am doing, you know, I am trying to put the insulin syringe into this. Because most of the times what happens is uh, people forget to mix the Magnavist. I mean it has happened. When it has happened once in my lifetime wherein I totally forgot to mix the Magnavist and it is very very common to you know do that. You, you forget in that procedure time. Uh, so that's why make sure that you mix the Magnavist and, and of course you need a three way tap. The key thing in MR orthogram or any kind of an orthogram if you've been doing it is not to inject air into the joint. The, not because it causes any harm, it is just that you don't know what pathology is and what the air bubble is. And sometimes it, you may pick it up, sometimes it can be tricky. So make sure that you flush that. You flush the entire thing so that there is no air bubble left in that three-way tube. Yeah? So let's move on to the next one. So this is actually the procedure, but I'm not, I'm not going to show you the actual procedure doing so what I will be doing is, you know, I'm just going to explain it to you. Uh, these are the three ways, you know, worldwide that's how you do. Either you do an anterior approach or a rotator interval approach or a posterior approach. I've done all these three things and uh, somehow I find my solace in that anterior approach. It is easy to do and uh, people vouch for doing it posterior approach because, you know, there's less chance that you go through any of the important structures. There's less chance that you damage the labrum. But once you have done it many times, you know, you kind of know that uh, uh, you're not going to cause much of an issue. So, if I talk about the anterior approach, as I said, this is the kind of a thing. Make sure you don't get into the joint. The last thing that you want is not to enter the joint because you will be going through the anterior labrum, right? don't hit the joint. Your main entry point is actually on the bone. So what I do, I will take my 10 ml syringe, I will nicely infiltrate the local anesthesia for the skin and I go dead vertical. You know, if that's the patient position, I just go dead vertical right over there. Okay? 
and keep infiltrating tiny touch of local anesthesia until I hit the bone. Once I hit the bone, I actually take a 5 mil of CT contrast and I inject to make sure that I am in the joint. If I am, if I am actually in the periosteum, you won't be able to infiltrate. It will feel very, very tight. You just have to come a, probably a very, very fraction of a thing superficial and then start injecting. Most of the times you will be in the joint. The key thing is go all the way hit, I mean of course you need to do it under fluoroscopic guidance. Every time you go in, you know, you take uh, your, your hands off, make sure that it is it is actually going in the right direction. You, once you hit the bone, you inject the ICT contrast, making sure that you are in the joint and then followed by this diluted mag magnavis or diluted sort of uh, gadolinium rather. Uh, this is the sequence of events. This is my needle. Most of the times a green tip needle, your green tip needle is enough to get into the joint in most of the times in an anterior approach. Sometimes if the patient is very obese, you may have to use a black spinal needle to go all the way. So a green tip needle is more than enough for most of the cases. But uh, like I deal with a lot of athletes and they are very, very muscular. So sometimes I may have to use a uh, sort of uh, a, a spinal needle to get into the joint. So what I will do, I just enter it take my hands off, screen it, make sure that it is in the right spot, take off, you know, go all the way, hit the bone and then inject the contrast. Once you inject the contrast, the thing that you will see is it just tends to go either subcoracoid, it just goes up and down and it pulls in the axillary recess once you start putting in more and more. So the what you don't want to see is just a big blob at there. Once you see the big blob, it is just either extra articular. I mean, it is most likely within the subscapularis tendon. So you don't want that. You want that sort of free flow of contrast once you inject. So that's what you need to look for. And very, very occasionally, or rather, I mean, it, uh, I always tell my patients that uh, uh, you may think that you are actually inside the joint, but you may be in the bursa. If they've got a tiny sort of uh, a distentious bursa, you may actually put it in the bursa and then you think that you're probably in the joint if you're not sure you know, how the contrast seeps in. So I always tell them that there's a, there's a chance that they may have to come back uh, for another uh, thing in case if it is extra articular. But I will say that it has never happened in my hand, but it, uh, I've seen it happening. So it is very easy to do that. This is your rotator interval approach. What I do is, this is the approach that I do. The second one is a rotator interval approach. See, basically the key thing is, this is your supraspinatus and this is your subscapularis. This is where all your, you know, you've got your long enough biceps tendon coming in. You have a potential space over there. The landmark, how do you identify? Look at the acromion, acromion on the AP view. Go exactly dead middle of that acromion, right? And then go, try to be towards the superior third of the humeral head. You know, if you just draw a line, you know, if you just draw a circle, it's just basically what you need to, to be at is exactly at the mid-level of the acromion, closer towards the superior third, well away from the joint. You know, this is your sort of anatomical landmark. You just get into the joint. Once you inject, you see that the contrast kind of seeps through, gets into the joint. This, this is a rotator interval approach and then the posterior approach, which I don't follow. Having done so many, there's only one time wherein I was unsuccessful in my anterior approach and I had to take the patient and do the same thing under a posterior approach and uh, under ultrasound guidance. I know people do it under ultrasound guidance. I'm sure I think Dr. Uh, Rajgopal does it under ultrasound guidance. That was the only time that I had to do under ultrasound guidance uh, using a posterior approach. I mean, uh, of all the orthograms that I've done. So most of the times it's simple and straightforward, you will see it. Uh, in terms of the sequences, the key thing is any any orthogram that you do, whether it is a shoulder or whether it is a hip you, or whether it's a wrist, I mean, we do it for various uh, reasons. The key thing is a T1 fat suppressed sequence. This is what you want. You just add T1 fat suppressed sequence in all three planes if you don't know what to do. And then you just need a PDFS or a T2FS sequence just to look at those tendons, just to identify any kind of a tendinitis or you know, those kind of a things, you need, you need a PDFS sequence. So this is what I do and I might add an ABUS sequence depending on my clinical indication, depending on what I see on the initial orthogram. If I have done an orthogram and I normally examine my own patients and if I think that there is a high degree of a labral pathology, 
If I am not able to see that on a normal uh, orthogram, I might do an able view just to see am I missing something. Because able view actually pulls that posterior band or rather anterior band of inferior glenohumeral ligament. It rips off that labrum, you know, it puts the tension on the anterior inferior labrum. If there is any tear, you can clearly see. It's the same applies to slap type 2 tears going posteriorly as well. So you will be able to appreciate all those things better on an able view. Suspected Perthes lesion, you will see better on able view. So there are a few indications for able view. I tend not to add the able view in everything, but I only use it if and when required. So let's move on to, you know, what do I see after taking an orthogram? So these are the things that I would be, you know, looking at. I will look at labrum, you know, I need to know my normal variance because if you don't know normal variance, uh, you know, you will be calling pathology on every, every MR orthogram that you would do. I can assure you that. And, you, I mean, of course, glenohumeral ligaments has been touched upon by uh, Dr. Roshan. And, of course, you need to know your capsular attachment, whether it's a type 1, type 2, type 3. And, and then, you know, pathologies. Labrum. Labrum always, in respect of whichever labrum you talk about, wherever uh, the body, you know, whichever body part, you always, it always looks black on pretty much most of the sequences that you do on MR. So, it should appear jet black. If you think that it is not appearing black or if you think that there is a whitish stuff going through, you need to start thinking about, am I dealing with a pathology? Hip and shoulder or any ball and socket kind of a joint when you're dealing with, you need to say that in a clockwise distribution. And the universal rule across the entire world is everything anterior is from 12 to 6, everything posterior is 12 to 6. Whether you are doing a hip orthogram, whether you are doing a shoulder orthogram, make sure that anything you say 1 to 2 o'clock position or 2 to 3 o'clock position always corresponds to anterior quadrant and the rest of the whatever 11 to 7 corresponds to the posterior quadrant. That's the general rule of thumb. Few normal anatomical variants which I would just uh, briefly touch upon is your sublabral recess. Another rule of thumb, anything you see between say 12 to 2 o'clock position You've got to be absolutely certain that that's a tear before you're giving it as a tear unless it's a slap tear. So because you see a lot of normal anatomical variants and uh, I mean having done so many of them, I'm yet to call something as a, a tear at a 2 o'clock position yet to because I, I tend not to do that unless, unless, unless you know it's, a, it's completely ripped off, it's a, it's a global tear across everywhere. So do think about uh, normal anatomical variants because you get what is called as a sublabral recess. When you do an orthogram, can you see this uh, part of the contrast is seeping through? How do you know it's a sublabral recess? Number one, it parallels the margin of the bony glenoid. It is not going vertical. It's actually paralleling the bony glenoid. Number two, it is very smooth. It is not ragged. You know, it's not ragged. Number three, you know, if you look at the thickness, it is very kind of, it's less than, usually it tends to be less than three millimeter. But having said that, even if you have a lot of slab tears which are less than three millimeter, the key thing is how, what is its orientation? Is it vertical or is it following the bony glenoid? That's the only thing that you want to know. And then the second most important thing is where is it? You know, it is usually seen between 11 to 1 o'clock position. That doesn't help us. Because all slap tests happen, you know, you're talking about around the same anatomical clock. So the key thing is the orientation, whether it's vertical or whether it's paralleling. The second thing is a sublabral foramen. This is what, you know, most of the people talk about tear in this position. You're talking about 1 to 3 o'clock. Probably, you know, I might not go up to 3, I might say, you know, 1 to 2 o'clock position. You always see a small foramen, small foramen through which the contrast seeps through. So, don't call it as a tear. Anything antero superior, think 100 times before you labeling that one as a tear, right? That's your sublabral foramen. Buffered complex, another normal anatomical variant. What you get, you know, when you scroll through, you will see that, you know, normally you're seeing this labrum, right? That's the posterior labrum. You know, I'm not going to go into the detail of the anatomy because it's already been covered. And you should see a similar black thing anteriorly, but you're not able to see that. So there's an absent antero superior labrum but if you come down i know that that's my subscapularis and i'm also seeing a big blob big sort of rounded globular structure you never see that so so sort of uh, you know prominently that's a very card like thickened mghl whenever you see that whenever you don't see any labrum antero superiorly automatically your eye should be drawn towards the lower cuts 
to see what has happened to MGHL. If the MGHL is normally normal in size, then it's not a buffered complex. Then you'll have to think, you know, am I really dealing with an anterosuperior labral tear? If it is card-like and thickened, then you're talking about, you know, a buffered complex. The glenohumeral ligaments, beautifully appreciated, as Dr. Roshan pointed out, you, you kind of, uh, you might struggle to see that on a non-orthographic image. Whereas when you do an orthogram, you know, you just, it just, it just, uh, it's, it's prominent. How do you identify? Look at the coracoid process. Whatever the structure which parallels the coracoid process is your SGHL, superior glenohumeral ligament. Anything which parallels coracoid is your SGHL. And then when you dip down, anything which, which is paralleling your subscapularis is your MGHL. That's your middle glenohumeral ligament. Anything which parallels your subscapularis is MGHL. And then inferiorly, you have your posterior band and an anterior band of your IGHL, inferior glenohumeral ligament. So this is what you do. When you go from top to bottom, anything paralleling coracoid is your SGHL, anything paralleling your subscapularis is your MGHL, and then inferiorly you can't have anything other than IGHL and a capsule. The other important piece of information that you need to give uh, a surgeon is what has happened to the capsule attachment. Am I dealing with a type 1 or a type 2 or a type 3? How do I identify? If you look at your sort of, uh, you know, capsule, you can see that it is roughly attached to the level of uh, the labrum. I mean, sometimes in the books, they will always show you something which is coming and attaching to the labrum over there. So that's your type 1. Type 2 is, you know, it attaches not at the labrum, but a little bit further medial to that. This distance has to be less than 1 centimeter. When you talk about type 3, you can see that it's well away. It is at the level of glenoid neck. It is about more than a centimeter from the level of glenoid margin. So that's your type 3 capsular attachment. Why it is important? Because type 3 capsular attachments are more prone for the subluxation and other things. You may not find anything, but you just have to tell them that there is a type 3 capsular attachment so that the surgeon knows that, uh, you know, this guy has, will have a lax uh, uh, shoulder. He is more prone for instability and all those things. So let's move on to the second topic, which is uh, instability. That's roughly covering the MR orthograph. You know, I hope you got like what all dilutions you required, how do you prepare and what is the approach and then how do you go about doing it. You know, I, I, mean, I wish if we had a patient we could have demonstrated it but I mean in a conference uh, it, it's always difficult to do that. And let's move on to the instability. You know, you talk about three kinds of instability. Is it, it's either a traumatic, a guy comes to you, you know, he has just fallen on his outstretched hand and he dislocates his shoulder, that's your traumatic component. Or it could be an atraumatic. You don't actually, you know, elicit any kind of a trauma in these guys. They come, they say that the doc, I mean, I've got my pain, you know, I've got pain in my shoulder, and when you examine, they will be generally lax. And uh, or it could be micro instability. So let's move on to the traumatic. Most of them tends to be an anterior dislocation. I mean, you've all seen X-rays. You've all seen dislocating it anteriorly. How many times you actually see it posterior dislocating? Very less. You know, about five percent of them. There is a pneumonic which is. Tubs. Basically what it means is it's traumatic, it always follows a, after a trauma and it's unidirectional. It's either anterior or it's a posterior kind of a thing and usually these guys require surgery and you know it's associated with this bank heart lesion. So that's your Tubbs pneumonic. Atraumatic instability. As I said, AMRI. So this is an atraumatic one. Unlike the traumatic one which is unidirectional, it is multidirectional. You get laxity all the way around. It's a global laxity that you get. And these patients tend to have a, you know, uh, a structural abnormality. It could be related to glenoid displacement. It could be something, you know. They tends to have a bilateral component rather than a unilateral one. And most of the times you just have to manage them conservatively. And if at all, if they require a surgery, you're talking about sort, sort of a capsular shift. The micro instability one is your all your acquired instability over stress shoulder. So the guys who deal with athletes, you will realize that you know, uh, especially bowlers uh, or, or javelin throwers or volleyball players tend to have a lot of these uh, AI OS issues. And uh, a traumatic shoulder instability. I mean, you can ignore this. I mean, this is what we will be concentrating later in the talk. So wh wh what do you do? You know, what are the modalities that you have? I mean, you have pretty much everything under, under your disposal, right? The first and foremost, if a guy walks into an emergency with a, with a dislocated shoulder, the first thing that you do is, of course, x-rays. X-rays, it goes without saying, that's our primary mode of uh, modality, and that's what we do, because you need to. The last thing that you want is uh, the guy to get into an MRI scanner with a dislocated shoulder. You don't want that to happen, so he needs to be relocated, and then, if at all, if you want to do, you can do an MR. So, obviously, first and foremost, x-rays. I mean, I'm not going to step into what are the different uh, views that you would uh, take. 
but X-rays are the mainstay of uh, thing. Ultrasound scan. I use extensively these ultrasound scan, uh, uh, but not in the context of an instability. Instability automatically I would go for uh, a cross-sectional imaging, usually an MR. 99% of the times it's an MR. Ultrasound scan is usually done for all your tendinitis, the bursitis, and you know the tears and uh, dynamic scans for looking at impingement and all those things. CT sometimes I do complement it with CT if I'm struggling to make a uh, make make if I'm struggling with respect to my bone loss. If I'm you know if I want a clarity on that, I would go for a CT. And as I said, the chances of me doing MR arthrogram these days have come down you know, quite less. I don't do that routinely purely because I get all the information on my three Tesla. So I tend not to go in unless I'm dealing with a post-operative, you know, the re-tear of the labrum or, uh, you know, uh, wherein I'm, I'm, not, I'm not completely satisfied with my MR images, non-orthographic images, and I'm, if I'm still struggling to give an answer. So traumatic anterior instability. The first and foremost, when you're scrolling through images, for a patient, you know, he gives a classical history, he has dislocated it many times and he has come to you or he might, he might give a history of recurrent subluxation. So there are a few things that you need to automatically look for. Number one, as the patient got a hill sax lesion, general rule of thumb, anything at or above the level of coracoid process on an axial image, that's where you need to see your hill sax lesion. You cannot go below the level of coracoid process on an axial image and keep commenting about a hill sacs lesion. Usually it is post superior. Why you shouldn't do that? Purely because you get a pseudo hill sacs lesion. It always looks slightly flattened. It always slightly looks slightly concave if you start commenting on the hill sacs lesion below the level of coracoid process. What I'm saying is if you see an axial image coracoid process at or above the level, that's where you need to comment on the hill sacs lesion. That's number one. The other thing that they want to know, is there a labral injury? I mean, all other things like capsular attachment, glenohumeral ligaments, of course, it goes without saying that you have to say it. So when I talk about labral injuries, we are talking about a traumatic anterior issue. So these are the things which comes into picture. Classic bank cards, what do you see? That's my posterior labrum. This is my anterior labrum. Ideally speaking, I should see a black structure which looks like this on here which I am not seeing. So this patient has actually toned the labrum. Whenever you see labral tears, there are a few things that you need to automatically comment. Number one, is the labrum toned? Number two, where is the tear? What is the clockwise distribution? Is it extending from two o'clock to six o'clock? Number three, is there a bony component to it? So all these things you know, should automatically flow in your report. And uh, you know, I'm sure the, the shoulder surgeon would appreciate when you start giving all those information. So what happens in a bony pancart lesion is you not only tear the labrum, you also take away a part of the, the chip of the bone. Here it is not only taken off the bone, it is also taken off uh, some amount of articular cartilage as well. So this is your sort of a bony pancart lesion. When we deal with a bony pancart lesion, the surgeon invariably wants to know what is the bony loss. This is something which you have to give. As I said, the critical thing is 20% of the bony loss or 25% of bony loss depending on which books you read, depending on which surgeon you deal with. So you need to have an understanding with your surgeon, you know, what exactly the bony loss that he is looking at. How do I measure it? You can either measure it on uh, MRI itself, but for the ease of this talk, I have actually shown you a uh, on-face view of a CT cuts. Okay, so what you need to do is once you have got this, you need to draw a best fit circle. A circle which fills up your glenoid and usually invariably it will be like it occupies two thirds of the glenoid margin. So once you have had it, once you have got this circle, you need to draw a line which is paralleling the glenoid uh, thing. You know, this is your glenoid. I mean you can't draw a line like this. It has to be like going through the midpoint of the, uh, the superior margin and midpoint of the inferior margin. So once you've got this line, draw an another line which is perpendicular to that. This is the diameter of that best fit circle. This is what you need to look for, okay? And then look at how much of bony loss is there. So basically it's a simple mathematics. You know, you just have to, you just have to divide this by this and into 100 that gives you uh, your bone loss. Give bone loss. Whenever you see bony component, do give, do comment on the bony loss. 
you can see this on MR, I will show you later on. You know, but for the ease of this talk, how I measure the bony loss, this is how I tend to measure based on the best fit circle. The same thing on a coronal view, I'm going to show this image later on when I'm talking about on track and off track lesion. So then comes all your variants. So you might ask me, you know, is it, uh, do I really need to know all these names? You don't really have to know all these names, but as long as you describe what you're seeing, the surgeon will automatically understand that he's dealing with either an alpha or a perthes. But if you can't describe it, at least name it. So what does alpha stands for? It's an anterior labral ligamentous periosteal sleeve avulsion. As the name suggests, the labrum gets ripped off, the periosteum gets ripped off. I have given you two examples. One is an orthographic image. This is a schematic diagram. You can see that the anterior scapula